in a little live stream. Uh, I was going to film a video, but my wife's out of town, and I'm home alone, and it's Saturday night, and I'm having a raging Saturday night, so I just decided, well, I'll talk about these things on a live stream. Mm -hmm. So, before, um, while I have people kind of trickling in on the live stream, I'm going to actually, um, hold on, there was some sort of notification. Um, okay, so before I have people trickling in on the live stream, um, I'm gonna kind of do a little update on what's going on. I've updated since the last two days. I've had the last two days off, so uh, welcome to the room. I'm just gonna kind of chit chat for a bit, but what I want to talk about today, tonight mainly, is fish smuggling and the cities. Uh, that's C I T I E S cities uh, fish act or Endangered Species Act, and um, species like the Asian arowana and things like that, and some of the crazy methods and things going on with um, people smuggling them. So we'll get to that uh, shortly, but as we wait for a couple people to notice that, oh, there's a live stream going on or whatever, I'm just going to kind of do a quick little rundown of what's going on in the fish room. So let me turn you around. I'm getting the hang of this... Uh, live stream thing a little bit better each time so bear with me folks but i have rescaped this tank and uh by the way on these live streams feel free hey what's up cecilia um i just have uh on these live streams i'm learning I'm still a newer channel two months old but uh i have a tripod now and uh, I will set settle that down once we're chatting and some people are in here. But the main thing is uh, I was going to do a rundown of what's going on in my tank. So over the weekend, wife's out of town. I'm able to make a giant mess without the uh, the the guilty feeling of, oh boy, I've made made quite the, the watery mess in here. And so I've rescaped this tank. Uh, you just got... Uh, yours today, your tank? Is that Cecilia? I don't know how much of a lag there is. Um, and I am more about chatting with people on here. So if someone's on here and they want to chat, uh, we'll be chatting rather than, um, you know, talking about the subject. Because any questions or anything like that that you folks have... Oh, your tripod. Oh, rad. Uh, so Cecilia was just saying she got her tripod today. Yeah, it makes a difference, definitely. Um, right now, I'm still holding the tripod, which has a little bit of a stabilization thing that helps a little bit, but, um, you know, I can set it down and we can, like, look at the shrimp tank, um, you know, a lot easier and less, sh like, jumbled and whatnot. But um, the unfortunate thing about YouTube is I can't really zoom in that well. Um, like zoom in and color correct and all that but so here's what's going on in the shrimp tank right now it's kind of uh bare bones um i wanted to just do a quick rundown of what's new so uh animal lover what's up welcome i love to see you in the chats uh you've been consistently here so welcome uh i'm just saying that i'm doing an update of what's going on again really quick um yeah, so I'm new to the live stream thing. Uh, I still can't do a lot of the features that some of the bigger channels can do. Um, so it's a learning curve. But I'm going to do some update chit chat here of what's going on. And then I want to talk about some uh, more serious subjects, which are black market um, fish and animals. And then we'll talk about um, maybe a little bit of shrimp genetics that I have had questions about. So maybe this is a good time while we're staring at the shrimp tank. And if you have questions about anything shrimp related or not, feel free to interject and I'll chat about them on, on these live streams. So basically I had multiple questions about a chart I posted. And here you can see we've got really new babies, um, just teeny. They're like the size of uh, an apostrophe uh, on, the, on the keyboard. Um, Oh, you love my snails? Thank you. So these snails I've selectively been breeding. They are uh, ram's horns, but they're... And it doesn't show up as well. Let's see if we can zoom in and maybe see it. I can't, like, color correct for light in here. 
Um, but they are iridescent, and then their flesh is bright pink and orange, depending on it. So they're an albino uh, snail version of the ram's horns. And I just had a ton of ram's horns in one of my other tanks, and I saw one albino, and so I grabbed it up, and then uh, it had eggs in this tank without any other ram's horns, which, so it must have been pregnant before. And, uh, yeah, they're super pink. So, uh, Cecilia, if you want some of these, um, I, as soon as they breed more, I think I've got, like, six or seven babies out of it, because they still mainly don't produce albinos, but they slowly are producing them, and I'm hoping to keep breeding selectively, um, because I really like the way they look, and I, I like having... Uh, in a shrimp tank, I like having Malaysian trumpet snails because they'll uh, change up the substrate. And then I like having ram's horn snails because uh, they're cool to look at and also they'll eat some of the bigger uh, things like uh, planaria or hydra. We've actually got a hydra right on the glass right now. So this has been an ongoing issue. Where is it? Will it even show up in here? Um, that's it right there, but you probably can't make heads or tails of that but in any case uh there they've been an issue in the shrimp tank not a serious one um yeah so cecilia just keep keep posted and we'll we'll get you squared away so i introduced some malaysian trumpet snails into the tank there's a baby one back there and they're great at um turning up the substrate and stuff like that um is, well the pond snails or the little common snails they're all over and i kind of wish i didn't have quite so many of them in here but um i know it sounds brutal but you can just like actually crush them with like tweezers and then the shrimps eat them right away and then their shells leave um calcium and stuff so like you can see, it looks like I'm gonna be getting another albino ram's horn right here. Um, and there's a few others around uh, the tank. And so this is like my selective breeding ram's horn tank. Um, up in here, we've got some coals uh, as well as, you can actually see the evolution of shrimp going on the selective breeding in here you can see that blue on the cheek of the female uh riley or really red shrimp there and you can see where she's got clear but she's still got some banding so that would be a low grade really shrimp um whereas let's see i don't want to bug them too much but under this rock there's a higher grade female and then this would be considered a cherry shrimp or almost a zebra shrimp but i had a question and it was over one of my videos which was how shrimps have come to be the color they are and that question was what so a guy had some shrimp and he said that he had um, some blue shrimp that reverted to a red color. And he said, well, your chart shows it going in one direction. So I just wanted to explain that the chart was actually the way that we arrived at these color combinations. It wasn't the the only way it flows. So when breeding shrimp, uh, I know a lot of people who are into shrimp or any species, I do shrimp and guppies and endlers are my main breeding ones. Um, but yeah, so when breeding shrimp, yeah, actually, if you like the uh, Rileys or Rileys, there are some babies that are about, oh, three weeks old. You probably can't see it so well. There's a tangerine one and a red one right over there. But it looks as though that she had uh, a good amount of babies. Hey, what's up, David? Uh, welcome. Always good to see you in here. I'm just doing some updates before I get the meat and, and potatoes of the live stream going as people are kind of trickling in and whatever, getting word of it. So another little thing going on in this, in this uh, tank is I have a... Um, Caradina uh, crystal red shrimp and I just keep that right in here with all the other shrimp in my tap water I'm not treating the water in any other way other than adding catapa leaves maple leaves mulberry leaves and then feeding them um, 
I've got crab cuisine is what I feed them. So, And then I've been feeding them out of little petri dishes to make less of a mess. But the snails seem to kind of steal the food and carry it out of the dish once in a while. Um, but in any case, yeah, this tank's going well. And uh, for the last video where people were confused, last genetics on shrimp, people were confused. Like, I thought that like a blue shrimp came from uh you know carbon release or or red release that were translucent and that translucent color happened to have blue in it which i happen to have an example of right here um this shrimp has a little bit of blue to it and up by its cheek if we can get it to focus you know what i'm gonna disturb them sorry guys your shrimpy time is over for now I keep these guys in quarantine until they're pregnant, which doesn't take long once they're saddled. Oh, you just ordered some Tampa aquaculture shrimp? Cool, let me know how it goes. Um, the guy, Garrick, who runs the place is really nice. Okay, so here you can see I have, and actually this one is from Tampa aquaculture. I just asked for some random shrimp, and this is kind of a red really shrimp, but you can see the blue on the cheek there. And that blue is something that breeders noticed, and they only selected other shrimp with blue. And then they came up with less and less red and more and more blue in the pigment from the clear. Now this was done here, and then it was done with a different variant of wild shrimp. Uh, a, and I can't pronounce the name, but it's like Zing Zhao Tai Tzu? I don't know how to say it exactly. Um, and then there's the Palmata strain of Neocaridina. But those are the three big strains that they've worked with in the hobby so far. And that's why we cull. So some people were asking why it reverts, why you can get reverts back to other colors. Now here you can see I've got my tangerine uh, babies. They are getting a couple weeks old now. I've got my uh, males there, a male and a female, and then I've got some uh, other little critters going on in here. I actually have some blue uh, baby shrimp, if you can see them. They're super teeny. They were born like yesterday up there. Um, and essentially, you that's why we cull. That's why we pull shrimp out. And luckily, I have a little store so I can sell all my coals. Um, and I'll keep them in here until, like, by the way, here's a big chocolate shrimp um, in there. And what those are called are throws. So that's what happens when um, when you don't keep up with culling your tank and a certain number, you can actually have shrimp revert back up the line of the chart. So you can refer to my how Neo Caradina shrimp have been bred to get their color thing. And that will tell you about that. But enough about shrimp right now. That's the shrimp genetics part. I told a couple viewers that I would uh, talk to them about that. Uh, right here, this is my newest aquascape. I stayed up late the other night, just home alone, having some fun. Got these rocks at a local, um, a local guy who has, I'm not kidding, probably an acre in the middle of Seattle, which is a lot of land. And he has it all trellised with this rock as the rockeries on a steep hill. And then he's got like moss and all sorts of, I mean, it's a cool yard. Um, but he's got that all set up for, um, as an architect and land, uh, he's into the nature thing. And so I asked him, where'd you get those stones? Can I get a few? And so he gave me about 50 pounds of the stone for free. But he had shipped it in from, I want to say Japan, actually. Uh, and yeah, so in this tank, I've decided to abandon my Australian theme. And now I want your guys' input on, you know, when this was just stone, you can check out the picture on one of my most recent posts. But it looked pretty monolithic and kind of cool. Like, um, kind of have to see it from a couple different angles. But 
when scaping, I try to like do the effect of weathering where you get like pieces that have broken off and shifted over time. So that's a little trick you can use. And then obviously when scaping uh, at the most basic level of scaping, you want to put your hardscape in first. And there's a video from the other day in on that. But then you want to do uh, horizon points or vanishing points. And so you want to decide where you're leading uh, people's eyes and that can be one primary spot ideally within two to three other spots and then you kind of want to use the rule of uh, yeah free is the best kind of rock rocks are stupid expensive in this hobby and in my opinion not worth it in every case so um, yeah but we've got uh, gudgeons in here peacock gudgeons three of them the male is spawning right now, and he has a little igloo, so kind of the hidden thing. And then we've got tiger endlers. These are Lucas Brett's original strain that I got via Cory at Aquarium Co-op, and they just had babies two nights ago, and so the babies are hanging out somewhere in the tank. I don't know where they're at. I want to put way more carpeting plant in here as well as some false little bonsai trees. We've also got some forktail uh, rainbow fish in here, and then the female endlers, which are obviously much larger than the two males in here. These were the last two male endlers that had blue, sp well, that had spade tails at all and happened to have that blue, that nice blue on their tail. So I got them, and I'm hoping that these babies back here, there's about five babies that were just born, um, will will continue that we'll be able to continue some selection from that sorry guys let me try zooming out here it's this is a very touchy app there we go all right so from above i just wanted to show you this little thing real quick so i have a little igloo uh type uh or yurt whatever you want to call it made out of terracotta and i've just crammed plants back in these corners behind the rockscape because I want the rocks to be the main feature in this scape in the future. And I'm going to do crypts and dwarf hair grass and a little more of an aquascape here. Um, and then try to get more plants in between things. But I really like the interplay of dark and light. And it's kind of, it leads your eye up to the pinnacle point. We might do another tower rock even over here to kind of hide the filters and stuff. Uh, I tried putting the filter on the side and I just, it didn't look good and it the flow was funky but this this layout has worked a lot better i've my blue uh reallys or rileys whatever you want to call them. i'm just gonna say uh reallys uh they're out and about and on the rocks um we have they molted last night a couple of them so i think the big shuffle of the tank there's about 15 shrimp in the, here that are either blue or their carbon release, which is where a lot of blue strains came from, either red release or carbon release. And so, yeah. Hey, Tilapia Store, what's up, man? Welcome, welcome. Just kind of doing a little update before I start talking about the seedy underbelly of the fish trade, um, showing this new Aquascape tank that I did the other night. Not in love with the gravel co color, I added black fluorite just for more substance because my local fish shop gave me like 30 pounds of it for free. Um, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, so essentially, I think, you know, I had Java ferns all up behind this in a wall and I didn't... It, it hid the rock. You didn't see, like, the rock wasn't what caught your eye. And I kind of like the rock being monolithic. So I've got to rethink that. If any of you guys have opinions or ideas, let me know. Um, over here, I could start to slowly do a wall. This stuff's beautiful. Uh, Rotala Wallachia. It, it turns, like, a burgundy red and purple when it grows uh, with CO2. So I might put some CO2 into this tank, too. And then I've just got some uh, compact temple plant over here with the red stems. But my goal being that I, I think in aquascaping there's two main styles. And that is the, main, the, the first style is to emulate nature, the Amano style. And to emulate it in 
in a way that it looks like a sneak peek at the underwater world of those fish or of a plausible stream or river. The next style, I think, is the Dutch and German style, which may still utilize that, but it does um, a lot more of like an underwater garden that has a wall of just color and color and plants and textures are kind of the main focus rather than what you'd naturally see. Uh, whereas the Japanese and Asian schools of aquascaping, definitely uh, minimalism is less is more a lot of times. And then the new wave to that is to create actually miniature scapes. So it's all about proportion. So it's not creating... Uh, what up, fake name? Uh, so it's all about creating proportion. So, like, if I were to throw in, um, let's see here, this piece of driftwood, if I put this in here, hold on, guys, one sec. If I put this piece of driftwood in here, the scale is totally blown. Like, you know that those are little rocks, and it is not an underwater mountain range you realize that this is a stream that happens to be organized. Oh, hey, yeah, do your water change. Cool. Yeah, always good to listen to the water change. I'll try to be more animated like a radio host. Also, you know what's weird is I have this rock that I got from the, uh, the architect. Whoa, super zoom. Sorry, guys. And it has like a weird X burning man slash, I don't know, dancing man if you're into the shrimp thing. But it like glitters in gold, and uh, it's all really solid igneous rock. Um, so I'm not worried about it leaching too much. But um, you do need to be aware of that if you're using other rocks. I have a geology miner, so if you guys have any questions about what rocks are safe, um, always, always, always put them in a bucket if you don't know where they're from and let them soak in water in neutral water for ideally like a week or even a month but three days is kind of my for sure test um you'll know if something severe is going on and then take readings on the tds if you can and on and on uh, ph and kh gh all that stuff uh, because you can use rocks to your advantage that have those properties. And I'm going to show you in a minute what I'm doing that actually is helping another tank. Um, but basically, yeah, so in the aquaculture and aquascaping world, I wanted a tank. So those are the two styles that I was just talking about. The next thing is there's the style of um, if you want it to look like a miniature mountain range or a miniature diorama almost. And that's where we we get into people using like spider wood as like um, fake bonsai trees and things like that. And I think that can look really cool too, but it requires a lot of maintenance. So like keeping this, uh, I have a question. What are you supposed to do with your fish if you purchase them legally in a local fish star and later they become illegal? Uh, in our country, currently, most of the time you are grandfathered in and you are just told not to buy anymore. Um, if you have an old Asian arowana or something, you should not be breeding it technically, but you are, I believe, grandfathered in. But it's more of a don't ask, don't tell. There are certain species, if they become critically endangered under the Cities Act, that they will say, please surrender them. But the penalties for not are not super severe in most cases, if you can prove you had it before. But if you don't have a receipt or anything, I wouldn't tell anyone about it. So um, in Canada, U.S., everybody has different laws about that and i'm going to talk about that more later after i talk about the catastrophe going on here so you can see uh tell no one yeah exactly we don't want to hear about it i don't want to hear about your awesome arowana or your crayfish or whatever it is that you have that's cooler than what i have um a lot of people have a lot of critters that are illegal um locally but then there's the whole endangered species level illegal, and that gets into some bigger trouble. But if it's just that you have, like, a self-replicating crayfish, um, 
you don't have to worry about it. But so what's going on in this tank is sad. So I moved around all the rock for that other small tank. This is my 40 gallon bow front, 40 some odd gallon. Uh, and I have a ton of rock piled in it right now, like a lot of rock. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I've got Corridori Hebrosis and then Julii's. The Hebrosis have spawned a couple times. The Julii's have not. And then I've also trying to be. I've been trying to raise these gray uh, ram's horn snails, which is a weird variant, but I just hadn't seen it. And so that's what's in here. And bronze pond snails. They're all bronze in this tank. Um, and then, so in here, you can see, like, my wisteria is just all over the place. I've got stuff floating up here right now in my guppy breeding section. The guppies escaped the net. My poor, poor tetras, the neon uh, green tetras, if you can see, they have ick at the moment. My rainbow fish that I got from Tampa Aquaculture, they got ick, and I know for a fact, I don't want to, like shout out the local fish store in Seattle that sold them to me, but I got plants and the tank looked really dirty. And I was like, Oh man, there's a lot of algae and issues in there. And they were like cleaning it out of fish and yeah, tilapia store. I'm, I'm right there with you with cranking the heat. So that is the game plan. The heat is up at 86, which wasn't actually getting the heat up hot enough. We should check right now. Um, it looks like I'm reading, see, I'm still only at 81, and uh, they got put on the ban list. Oh, okay. Yeah, minnows, those cloud minnows. That's kind of silly because there's so many in the trade now. I wouldn't sweat it. Just don't sell them on Craigslist or anything publicly like that. But I, I'm not a lawyer. I can't give you legal advice, but uh, that's what I would do. But... In any case, uh, I then got another one of my extra heaters. Yeah, it's working. Okay. And they're both cranked to 86 trying to get this tank hotter to get rid of the ick. I also have ick X and all that stuff, but I haven't noticed that it works super well always. Like, the heat seems to do just as good of a job. But, yeah, so I know it came in on the one fish that I got at a store that usually is a store I like, and he's got a presence on YouTube, and so I don't want to call out, out that group. But within a matter of three days now, we've got four dead neon tetras and a dead guppy and about seven fish with ick out of the 25 fish or so and 30 fish in this tank. So I'm really sad about that. Luckily, I mean, not that it makes it less sad that the fish died, but they were fish that didn't, uh, they weren't expensive fish. They were guppies and, uh, neons. Yeah. He, I think it does a better job than the chemicals. Plus the chemicals stain everything, different colors or, you know, whatever I put garlic and, uh, uh, I put garlic and then I turn up the heat is what I've done in the past. Surprisingly, the guppies don't have it. I've got a mating pair in here. And the whole point being is she has a really nice rainbow tail that's bright yellow. And so I wanted her to mate with uh, this male that has the same characteristics so that I can tell them apart. Because my other strains like my bluegrass or my panda guppies they don't actually stand out at all like i can't i can't spot the difference um between them the females and so that's frustrating when you're trying to later breed and i'm not trying to do true breeding or anything but i'd like to have an idea and you know wait until they're pregnant to put them in a pen together so this is kind of the guppy mixed com community there is a snail that i don't know what type it is but it's it looks kind of like the pond snails but it's far pointier so i'm gonna have to look into that I, I can't remember it could just be a morph of that but yeah so that's what's going on in this sad tank also i'm a little worried about the seam on the outside before i even put rocks in it this other side here over here uh has like the glass is not yeah, I, I was thinking a bladder snail possibly too. Not sure. But the 
the seam on the tank isn't the strongest. And by the way, uh, if you have any Cory cats, I have Hebrosis and Julia, they love like the half an algae wafer. That will get them going crazy every single time. So I put that in a half hour ago and they're still working on it. It's kind of like a lollipop. Luckily, my Rummy Nose Tetras, not a single one got ick. Um, my Neon Dwarf Rainbow Fish, not a single one got ick. But sadly, my the ones that Tampa Aquaculture, um, Garrick over there, sent me, sadly, uh, I think with their delicate finage, they have got uh, a little bit of it. And so I'm keeping an eye on them. The heat's cranked. It's at 82 right now, but I need it to be at like 84 or 5. But because of this heat cranking um, and just various other reasons, I'm going to show you my illegal minnows um and they already had their sun today because they have a window that come on uh, they have a window um that brings light in right here in the morning for a good amount of time i'm going a little bit choppy hopefully it'll calm down is it calming down at all um, but in any case, I have a bowl and I know it looks small, but it's 2.2 .2 gallons right now and they're fine in there for now, but there's three, um, red cloud or meteor minnows. They're just a variation of white cloud. I'm getting them used to cold temperature and out of that hot tank because, so they're in a little flower. Yeah. Those are my favorite minnows too. Um, those ones in the blue variants. But all my tanks right now are at like 78 or hotter. And so I wanted to get them into like 60 degree. I keep my house kind of cool. So it's like 60 degrees. And I wanted to keep them there. By the way, my um, Nigerian red uh, pelvica chromis tenatius, uh, the female has been in the coconut or right at the entrance to it all day long. And the male has been doing rounds and kind of coming back to her every so often to check in and switching off and she's been territorial so i'm hoping fingers crossed that they mated because earlier too they also went in together into the coconut overnight and i thought they were losing interest because the male isn't quite as colorful as he once was but i turned down the brightness on the lights i did a big water change to represent the the dry season. Another little update on this tank is these rocket killifish. So you can see they're pretty cool. That's a full grown adult. And uh, they've got yellow tails and that look like a rocket booster or flame. And then they've got um, the black and white striping. They're either called rocket killifish or clown uh, striped killifish. She's going back in there. He might go in there too. But he's been hanging close. I'm really hoping they're having babies because I've been just like literally having to spoon feed these guys. They like their live food. So I'm kind of wondering, while we're going to talk about soon the illegal pet trade, I'm kind of wondering if these guys came in not just from a local breeder but from the wild. Another interesting thing that's been going on in this tank is my snails. Like, look at that. There's like one, two, three, four, five. There's over a dozen snails piled in right here. Ah, man, the zoom on this is awful. Sorry, guys. So touchy. Uh, but the snails are just piled on top of each other. And maybe someone knows what that behavior is about. Let me know. I'm curious. Uh, the female is definitely guarding and scaring off anybody who come to mess with her, her fort. But she's beautiful. I really like this Nigerian red crib variety, dwarf cichlid. They're from Cameroon, uh, Nigeria. See, she's really scaring off other fish. I've never seen her be that way. She's been really calm. So I'm just hoping that they finally had their babies. So that would be great because so many people have requested. And so if you're one of my Patreon followers, you get dibs on fish. So like if I'm breeding, um, I'm probably going to do some giveaways if I have like big litters and where you just can pay like shipping and that's that. But on small litters uh, of fish, shrimp, that kind of thing, uh, I will probably be doing um, like, you know, 20 bucks for 
20 to 40 bucks for a pair depending on how they look uh whereas i bought these for 80 and it was supposed to be over 160 dollars which i know is crazy and i'd never usually spend that on fish but i fell in love with the way they interact and they kiss and they uh, cuddle and they like twirl around each other and they just have so much personality uh between the male and female they're so bonded like he for a while when they first got in this tank wouldn't leave her side and he um this male here they're beautiful is there salt in that tank no no salt in this tank there is crushed coral for the guppies but no salt this is a pelvica chromis tenaceous nigerian red it, they live in the rainforests of nigeria cameroon sierra leone but it's a very specific uh type of crib crebensis uh, and it's a harder to find one. The wet spot in Portland has some that you can order, uh, but I think these may have come from the wild, and this is part of what sparked my question um, about black market fish. I've always been interested in that. And by the way, this female guppy, or actually that's an endler. She came in with that Japanese blue endler, and she's going to be giving birth soon because I always notice the males nipping at her um, gravid spot when they're about to give birth. Also, another new guppy um, that I got that was one of Corey's from Aquarium Co-op's projects, these two here, um, so that I could tell the difference. So that female has a nice yellowish green. Only thing is, I think she might be getting ick. And this is a different tank, and I'm really frustrated because if anything happens to these pelvic acromis, I'm going to be so sad monetarily and just because i started to watch them see that itch there that she did i'm going to be cranking the heat in fact as we speak that was enough of an indication for me that i'm going to turn it up a bit so usually they reproduce with a little bit of heat anyways near the end of the the dry season when the wet season's coming and they'll they'll bury their own little like they'll make a little home in this coconut and before the the gravel was too coarse and they weren't able to move it effic efficiently, but um, she can now move with her mouth and tail stuff at the entrance, and she's made the entrance to the the um, hide where hopefully there are eggs. I don't want to check, but she's made it so that she can fit, but he can barely fit. And in most cribs, I think the male a lot of times will be guarding. Um, from my experience, but she's the one guarding the cave from the inside most of the time, but he'll go in there and check on her, and his colors have faded a little bit. Believe it or not, he was even brighter, and he had purple lines all down his side and everything, but she's just, like, concerned that there's all these pesty f fish around, and so... I'm going to kind of move a few things real quick just to get... Snails are a threat to them. Oh, they're eating an algae wafer. That's what's up. Um, sna see, she'll even come after me. If I move a plant in there, she'll go, go for my hand. And it's odd because I don't know what the heck she thinks she's going to do. She doesn't even have, like, teeth that you can feel. But I want to talk a little bit for a sec again about aquascaping while I'm at this tank. So this tank is chock full of plants, like insanely. And that's because, so those killifish that I mentioned, um, they, I got two of them at a local store and they were like, hey, these are, um, these are really cool new killifish that we have in, check them out, you'll like them, like they know my, my style. They're from the same exact region as the pelvic acromis. Um, oh, yeah, you watched the video about me when I changed the substrate. Yeah, I'm really glad I did because now they can kind of work with it a little bit more. Although they've kind of like put boulders back in the sand. So I'm letting them do their thing, but I, I think they're a little bit... I must not be recreating nature quite perfectly for them. But in any case, these killifish... So there's the ones with the bright red and orange and yellow tails. There's two of them that are obvious. And then there's these other little ones. And the other little ones, I was told at the store by the guy, 
oh yeah, we got some killifish and they're like six bucks a piece, man. And so I was like, cool, I'll, I'll take those. Uh, they live in the same area as these guys. And by the way, I think I'm going to move some of these guppies because they're stressing her out. Um, I don't know. If you guys have raised cribs, you can maybe comment on whether enough is enough with the guppies. Um, but it seems to be stressing her out from whatever she's protecting her den. Uh, also... Little fish think that they're tough. Leopard Dan... Yeah, it's it's bizarre. Like, I know they're willing to die for their young, but, like, if there was a turtle or something, like, what are you going to do? Like, you can't... You don't have teeth. Like, what are you going to do? They eat half vegetation. I hope he swims in here. You'll Oh, there you go. So you can see what a tight fit that is for him. He has to swim sideways. And she's the one who carved out the burrow for him. Um... So it's been interesting to watch what they do, and they kind of take turns in there. But she's annoyed with all these damn dirty guppies hanging out. So maybe I'll feed the guppies up at the top here tonight so that they'll leave them alone a little bit, kind of give them some areas. But I've got these massive java ferns in here. These things, some of them are like, that's touching the bottom of the water still um, back in here. And so I've got these java ferns that are um, out of control, essentially. And they had been over in this tank, uh, the 40 gal, or whatever it is. And I took them out shortly before the ick stuff happened, about a week before I got the new fish. And I was thinking of selling them. I was thinking of using them in the scape of that tank over there. But um, they overpower the rock too much. It's not enough of a contrast. I think I need something like this red Rotala that, um, yeah, love watching them. I would, yeah, no, I had a friend who came over and he literally pulls up a chair from our, our little breakfast nook slash kitchen area over here. And he sits and just stares at the fish. I mean, he's kind of a stoner. I love the guy genius but <laughs> he just comes over and will like sit and like i'm like how's life oh it, it's okay it's it's fine it's fine so do they do this all the time like he just gets so into it right now male's still in there but so what i was saying about aquascaping earlier too is the little bonsai tree thing so i've gotten plants from africa some anubias and some um uh the Nana Petite variety and then Africa Gold Coin, as well as a few other odds and ends in here. Um, some small fern like plants, and I can't remember the Latin name on them. Sorry, guys. I know I've got Mayaka and all sorts of stuff that's not native, and some Indian Rotala in there. But um, I made kind of this, it might be too dark to see, but it's basically like a little. There you go, you can see it now. Uh, a bonsai fort, and the, the cribs started hanging out in there when I first got them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nothing against it. In here in Washington, it's legal to get stoned and watch your fish tank. So I used to be a stoner. I used to smoke all the time, but I, I haven't for years. It gives me anxiety. Fish, fish calm me down, though. I still sit and stare at my fish. I think there's so much going on on your fish tank. And that's what this channel is about, too, is, like, I'm in between some gigs with graphic design and doing freelance art. As you probably noticed, I've got art all over the place and messy projects going on all over the place. Um, I do, like, hand lettering menus and wedding artwork and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I've been taking a break from that a little bit, and I decided let's switch this around and I decided that I'm gonna be doing um more of the fish stuff for a little bit and like kind of have some fun with the social media aspect of it and all that jazz so looks like I have eyeliner for some reason that's weird that's just the light <laughs> it's like did I put on eyeliner am I a stoner um my nose is healing up from the video, if anybody remembers, when the bungee cord caught me in the face. Uh, also, it cut me across here, and that's all healed up, so yay. Um, and I got this tripod that I'm holding, so I'll set it down, 
and actually use the darn thing that I bought with my first $15 uh, on Patreon. Thank you so much, you guys. If you're any of the Patreon supporters, that is worth worlds to me uh, to keep this going, to keep the lights on and the fish. Also makes it so like I want to keep, I want to get rid of the ads a little bit if I can help that. And like, if, if I can get rid of ads and just have a little coming in, people giving a buck here or there, then that will make make it so it's it's sustainable to spend 20 or 30 hours a week researching and checking stuff out um does that look better okay cool so next we're gonna turn the camera back to the computer if you guys have any questions just let me know through all of this but basically i just wanted to share with you a little bit of info on fish smuggling in black market i know it took me 45 minutes to get here but now there's a good number of you in here and uh oh also don't forget to click like if you do like it if you don't like it don't click like uh click unlike or whatever <laughs> i want you guys to be honest i want to earn your uh appreciation and and worth so i am having issues on the computer and it will not, uh, let's see, it will not currently let me do, uh, and that's, that color's totally wrong, um, let's see here, let's see if we can get it down to closer, I don't know, this thing's a beautiful blood red arowana, but I was going to talk about the cities convention. So uh, the Cities Act, C-I-T-I-E-S, is basically an act that decides what's legal and what's not as far as fish go, and all sorts of other species too. But for our sake of speaking, fish, shellfish, mollusk, those kind of things, like abalone is another one that uh, is not in the hobby, but people uh, have poached really badly and gets sold off. So in this little slideshow that I kind of put together just as I was researching, there's some of the methods that people have used to smuggle, and I'm going to tell you the craziest method um, that I actually happened to speak to somebody about, linking back to asking someone from Nigeria, hey, what other fish can you get, talking to his family uh, back home, and he said he could get me whatever I wanted, and then I started to get nervous. <laughs> so... I'll tell you that story coming up after this little bit. But basically, the Cities Act, uh, it's kind of an international thing, almost like NATO, where people, or the UN, not, NATO wasn't a good example. That's just Northern European and Atlantic com countries. Uh, but it's kind of like the UN. It's a group. World Wildlife Fund works with them. Uh, Interpol and the FBI all work with them also. Uh, but basically, they get together and they list which fish are threatened and endangered, which fish are um, potentially a problem, and which ones shouldn't be traded. So right now, we've got like Zebra Pleco, and um, that's L046, I think and Asian arowanas and a lot of variations. And there's a lot of different levels. So the first one is Appendix A, and that means that the species is in threat of extinction. And so they put the uh, blood reds and the metallic arowana variants from Asia in that, in that category. And now trade has supposed to have been ceased from the wild. Now, you can still get stamps as a collector or, like, tax stamps as a collector or as somebody um, affiliated with the zoo or an aquarium or whatever. Uh, there's ways around it where they let you ship things. But it's, it's tricky. So for all intents and purposes, you're not getting them uh, legally. So... This has become a major, major uh, smuggling issue. And these have been known as dragonfish for a long time in Asia, Japan. And they've also been believed to bring luck and prosperity, as well as being kind of a status symbol, like a Ferrari or something. Especially when they've become illegal, it's kind of ironically made it more 
cool to have them uh, in the elite world. So there's a brief story about a man named uh, Chan uh, Kok Kwan, and he was a Taiwanese man, and he had been selling these type, this red type, uh, red metallic, uh, um, pardon me, I don't know all the names, but it was a red metallic. This is a picture of the type. Um, Arowanas, and uh, he sold them for $150,000 a piece to Japanese collectors. So these fish were going for $150,000 to get them smuggled in uh, into the country and at size, and if they were smaller... Uh, they were going for anywhere from ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars as like fry, so very illegal. You can go to jail for up to thirty years for it. Then there's Appendix Two, and Appendix Two is a, a species of fish that are threatened, and there's a, a probability that they will become extinct if collection in the wild keeps occurring and i know that a lot of these fish now have been bred in captivity but that doesn't stop the wild trade it just causes people to go out and catch them in the wild and also sell them and then you know it's hard to tell which is which so i mean i understand both sides of the argument that that's silly and we should allow it and then I understand that it's not a good thing to have, uh, you know, it's like elephant ivory. If you allow old ivory to be around, um, you can't differentiate what is new ivory. Plus, then there's a market. And even though the black market may be more money, an open market may be more money in total rather than for each item because you've got so many more people willing to engage in it. So there's different arguments about that, and sometimes people say putting them on these banned lists causes them to be more valuable, and even though less people are buying them, more people are trying to get them out of the wild, and they don't know what they're doing sometimes, and they end up killing them or electrifying a pond to get them out of the water, um, using dynamite. I mean, there's all sorts of things. Using tranquilizers in the water. So it's a kind of crazy, gritty business. Um, with the plecos, Brazil is really uh, Ibama with an I. I-B-A-M-A. -A. Not, like, not like President Obama, but Ibama. They are controlling the amount of fish being caught and exported. And they've severely clamped down on the uh as the british would say the zebra pleco um and they are no longer coming out legally so now there's all these smuggling routes through guiana and uh suriname and uh um peru ecuador and even to the south which is like way out of the way but i guess it's easy enough to travel through the country with fish um so they're getting out anyhow, and now they're fetching crazy prices like 250 all the way up to $500. I heard a story about a guy trying to smuggle a bunch of fish on an airplane. He... So, funny that you mentioned that fake name. Uh, Ta-da! This guy had a whole bunch of red-tailed catfish literally in his pants. And I don't know if he had a fat suit or what. But they caught him trying to fly through L.A. And let's scoot this back so you can see. Uh, yeah. So, kind of crazy. And another guy that they found, these were like teeny bags. Those tiles are small tiles. But they were like teeny bags that were on a group of four people. And they were arowana and other fry coming out of Vietnam. Uh, that they caught at O'Hare Airport. So that means they had to do a layover, which is impressive. These were confiscated in Miami. They are pleco that are illegal at the moment. Uh, this is snakes and lizards, but also fish. 
And so it's becoming harder with body scanners and things like that to to do something as outrageous as these attempts are. This is a guy who had like 50 parrot or birds or finches or something strapped to his thighs and his legs. But here you can see there's vials. And in those vials, they're also keeping reptile eggs and fish eggs. Um, and the body warmth ideally is keeping them warm enough. This is a children's book that had uh, banned geckos in it. Um, then there is, this is from um, a bunch of different creatures. There's like some African butterfly fish that's endangered there. And uh, basically Australia takes things really serious because they're an island and if something gets out, it can really cause a problem like the cane toad. So that leads to the third part of the, this is another example. Somebody had false bottoms in their luggage and they had teeny tiny, just new hatch turtles or desert tortoises. I want to say the article, I can't remember what the article said, but uh, the third appendix of the cities act that controls uh, critters is animals that are invasive or could be a problem. So that ends up being uh, like crayfish or um, snakehead fish or jumping carp, you know, like this, the silver carps and stuff that jump all over the place in the Midwest and Indiana and stuff. Uh, they are fish that are a problem. And that's kind of up to a locality, and that's why that's Appendix 3 or Appendix 3. And then also in that group, and that group can be changed by each nation rather than the whole international body, whereas 1 and 2 are serious enough that they get together and they vote however often, uh, and they have emergency meetings and then annual or quarterly meetings on the rest of it. Um but essentially, now there is the new category because of genetic modification, but mostly just because of selective breeding, that there, there, is now, there are now species that are getting put on the list in Appendix 3, which are being banned simply because they look like other species, like because they look like the arowanas that are illegal. Um, which I kind of have a problem with. Uh, it seems kind of ridiculous to me, but I, I I get that they're trying to stop the confusion because like the average border control guy isn't going to know what has a proper tax stamp. And also it creates a market just like um, trying to stop counterfeit like Gucci clothing or whatever or counterfeit Rolex. Uh, the idea is that then they can keep track of and not have these hybrid species that sometimes can interbreed. Um, but that's kind of a new thing, and I don't know how much, how many species are there because of that. But with plecos, um, you know, a lot of times there's a northern, like Peruvian population or a western population, and then there's like a southern, southeastern population. And the fish looks the same, but genetically their markers are different and they've been isolated for like 2,000 years. And so they have to say that, um, you know, the zebra pleco, we're not exporting these or we're only exporting 20. Like if it's Appendix 2, they can export for commercial. Appendix 1, it's no commercial trade. Um, only like even for like zoos and things, I think it's supposed to be now... Uh, free and for conservation agreed upon between governments and the way they get around that is they say you need to build a four million dollar exhibit for us to take care of this panda or whatever and then uh, a loan fee to the country but you're not buying it so like the pandas in dc were rent the zoos are renting them for like i don't know i think it's like two million dollars a year or something ridiculous uh, look it up there was a Washington Post or New York Times article on renting pandas and how zoos do that. But then it's supposedly the money goes back to conservation. I don't know how much of it does or doesn't. But so next, um, this was another case. This is eggs and money. So this is the, the new method of smuggling. 
And yeah, you're going to get caught if you get scanned at a like scanner on the border, but uh, like like we have in the U.S. But one, not all airports have that. Two, they may get on a plane in Thailand that doesn't have advanced imaging, and then they end up in, landing in Mexico, and then they pay someone in Mexico to smuggle it to the U.S. So that's why you're still seeing this, especially in Southeast Asia. That's where a lot of the species come from. Papua New Guinea, Borneo, um, Sulawesi, or Sulawesi, uh, however you want to say it, Indonesia's big island. Um, a lot of those places have species of all sorts, not just fish that are coming out, especially in poor countries. Like Papua New Guinea is still a relatively impoverished country, and people are willing to try to do anything, even if it means they get 50 US dollars for each fish that's going to sell for 5000 it's worth the risk to try for them. So um, this was another picture, and it was just um, of arowanas that were smuggled. Kind of sad. Um, but yeah, the and had died in shipping. Because the thing is, with fish, you're going to have to either fly or set up a full aquarium in your tanker ship or whatever. And uh, I just, this one cracks me up, like, like a raver pants full of fish. Uh, now let me tell you the story. Unnamed sources. But talk to somebody who was dealing in pelvic acromus, Nigerian variants. Also, uh, pelvic acromus pulcher and uh, some killifish and some other things, as well as snakes and frogs. So... This guy happened to be a Lyft, was it Lyft? Lyft or Uber driver, and I happened to run into him, and we got talking about fish, and he said that his brother could hook up anything, and that therefore he could hook up anything, and he told me a story about how his brother, actually they have a big house there, or like in their village, in outside of Lagos, and they have a farm, a fish farm, and they legally sell what they can, but there's certain species that they can't trade or sell or that locally they're, um, they need tax stamps like that are, you know, $1,500 or shipping's really expensive or overnight freight delivery is really expensive. And for them, just getting a ticket to come to the U.S. to visit is like the most money that they're going to have. So... He said that what they've been resorting to, and in Southeast Asia this is true also, especially to getting things into China like rhino horn and things, is apparently they've been putting in water in small, small test tubes with eggs that were laid the day before and some sort of oxidizer in the water and some sort of buffer that allows the water not to get too hot to your internal temperature. But people are literally swallowing, just like cocaine mules do, uh, rare exotic reptile fish and bird eggs. Easier being fish eggs. Uh, and then, you know, maybe only 10% will hatch when they get them out of the test tube, go to the bathroom when they arrive in the U.S., and uh, try to raise them up in a fry incubator. And I think that's insane and crazy but also kind of fascinating so if anybody knows any more about this or has any anecdotal or real experience on it i'd love you to get a hold of me um, because i want to look into it more i know that vietnam laos thailand burma burma is a big one right now because uh, burma or myanmar um closed off from the rest of the world for years because of the harsh dictatorship there uh, and now scientists are getting back in and they found all sorts of cool rasporas and uh, other fish. So, yeah, they're, they're becoming another spot where people are bringing fish back. And it's not all, like, bad illegal fish that get smuggled either. A lot of it is just people don't want to pay customs and taxes or there's they're considered invasive in a certain country. I live in Seattle where it's cold and you'd think that like most fish wouldn't be susceptible to being an invasive species because like 
it's cold, like up in Canada too. Like it, if they can't survive below 70 degrees in a tank, you'd think that winter would be too cold for them. Um, but in Florida, I totally understand. They have invasive, they have like 800 invasive species now. Um, so in any case, I'm going to answer any questions you guys have. That was just kind of a little rundown of some photos and some stuff I saw. I'm going to do more investigative work and actually try to get a hold of some smugglers. I know that sounds weird and epic and like out of like, why would you do that or something like that? Or how do you even go about that? But I have a history of being not the best kid as a teenager and early 20 year old. <laughs> and now I'm really boring. I'm like watching Netflix and researching fish all night. Um, but I do know friends that are still involved in that world or in and out of jail or whatever. We've kind of cut ties, but I have some ideas of maybe um, specifically in the international district in Seattle. I know it goes on. And I hadn't seen it going on. I've seen drugs, obviously, but I hadn't seen the illegal animal trade going on for some time now in public. Um, once in a while on Craigslist, you'll see someone posting a dumb post like, I've got American crocodiles, which are really endangered, or, you know, alligators or caiman. Um, but I want to try to question some people, possibly... Um, I don't know if I want to go all the way to finding the smuggler, but I want to know the ways um, because I feel like I have an obligation to say something at a certain point if the smuggling's really bad and nefarious. If people are bringing in hatched fishery arowanas for people who have lots of money and have a nice setup, me personally, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. I get why, legally speaking, we don't want that though. But I think, like, you know, you can see um, Joey Waru on the Fish Keeper, DIY Fish Keeper, in Canada, where you can have the arowanas with the right permits. He's a perfect example of someone who should be able to have them, in my opinion, especially if they're farm-raised. And I think that can save the species. The argument of the World Wildlife Federation, Obama and, um, not Obama, Obama, uh, and... Um, the Cities Act Coalition, is that if we breed these in captivity, we'll interbreed them and ruin the gene pool, and we don't have a wide enough selection in many cases, and re-releasing them into the wild, they've been in tanks with other fish or in conditions where they can get worms and fungal infections, and that's actually happened in other species outside the fish world, where they have been raised in captivity for conservation then they're released and they kill the remaining population of actual true wild um there was a case um recently where there's some buffalo in utah and there was a ranch where a guy privately put them up on this butte that there's no way down and he actually used a helicopter to get him up there which is insane i don't know why he did it there's like a you know a 50 acre plateau up on this butte and he put bison up there, and he did it long enough ago that he sourced them from a true strain of them. And then the rest of the property, there was some really hard to get to slot canyons, which are like deep canyons with big drop-offs. Um, okay, so I'm just reading now, never heard of needing a permit for arowana in Canada. Um, yeah, I don't know how it works. On his channel, he mentioned that he had to go through some stamp tax thing to import arowana, Asian arowana, to keep Asian arowana that the other kinds are fine, but the metallic and the blood-colored ones, the red-finned ones, those ones are the harder ones to get. Um, I don't know. Oh, yeah, and maybe it's, you know, maybe it's municipalities and cities and stuff that have a different thing. He's way up in Canada where there's like, I think there's like a million people in that whole province and like he lives away from the main population center. So I'm kind of surprised that he's not in Halifax or anything. So I'm kind of surprised that he's like, I mean, that's, I guess that's why Joey does it himself is because uh, you can't, I don't know where you're going to source stuff for such specialized things other than amazon.com or something. Um, I'm going to do another episode, by the way, of 
Amazon.com versus fish farmers and local breeders and local fish stores and the like torn part of my soul that's trying to decide where where we what is ethically correct about like should we keep local fish stores yeah i think that would include aquabid because aquabid is a way that a lot of local breeders are able to or small time independent breeders are then able to get fish across the country and actually make it a sustainable hobby i plan on using aquabid with my cribs when they have babies um i mean fish stuff is expensive and if i want another if i want another tank um first i'll have to use some money to buy my wife a really nice dinner and have a conversation when she's uh, in a good mood and then i will need to pitch which tank it's going to be because uh <clears throat> yeah aquabit is pretty much the only place i can find canadian fish uh, where do you live in Canada, fake name? I know it's BC, but what part of BC are you in? Um, in any case, let me finish up the Buffalo story real quick, and then I'll get back to question stuff. Um, in any case, uh, these buffalo lived in the Slot Canyon in Utah on a private farm and end up um, not having any diseases yet all wild buffalo at Yellowstone Park up in Canada, everywhere else in the world, uh, bison, got um, a, a disease that cattle, that domesticated cattle have. And so there was only one population left that they just found a few years ago from this private ranch that had them put way in the middle of nowhere. Some were from the 20s and some were from the 70s, I want to say, where he had gotten them delivered somehow up onto the cliff. I said helicopter. I don't know if it's a helicopter, but I would assume something like that because you're not going to carry a baby up there. Maybe a small plane you could get a baby up there, like those jokers in Yellowstone who uh, put a baby bison in their car two years ago. That was insane. Um, but yeah, so that is why we don't necessarily want people raising endangered species in uncontrolled like non-scientific conditions now there's plenty of hobbyists that do a great job and probably wouldn't mess that up for anybody but you just you just have to be careful um it's hard to know like what unintended un unintended consequences are uh it's best to try to preserve a endangered species in its habitat you know, the condor is a really good example of a success story with preservation. Uh, the cloud minnow, mountain cloud minnow, obviously they thought that was extinct in up until recently. Then they found a divergent population in Henan, China, and into the south, a warmer. That's actually where some of the new meteor minnows come from. But um, there's also the more northern population originally uh, the, uh, what are they called? Um, tran fish or han, han fish or tr tran fish. I can't remember. I'm sorry, but it's named after a boy scout in China in the 1930s who discovered these minnows in a mountain stream at like 4,000 feet or 5,000 feet, uh, elevation. Like what's that? 1200 meters or something like that. Um, so kind of interesting. Last thing before I go, uh, and is, let me turn this around. So, what do you guys think of the aquascape? Do I add plants to the background? I'm thinking red ones. Or do I get rid of the Rotala Walikia and keep all plants below the peaks of these three things that would mean that i need a lot of water lettuce or red root uh pond stuff um sorry all the water stains on the thing i've been monkeying with it all day but if you guys have a, a comment ooh, yay my endler is presenting as though he is getting ready to mate 
This is my only true Guppy Strain tank. Not Guppy, sorry, Endler, uh, but Live Bear. And this is strictly this Leopard Strain. Um, Lucas Bretts bred it, and then Corey um, from Aquarium Co-op clearly bought some, and they ended up in his shop. But they're called a Rainbow. Uh, the ones that Lucas had that Corey got a hold of are called a Rainbow uh, tiger endler and I got them for ooh $20 for a pair of them and the bummer part was the females I went through I bought six females total and two males females that they sold me originally you can see one still they're so teeny they were like a month old and three turned out to not even be Endlers. They were guppies and they were young male guppies. So, I mean, I know that's hard to sex, but like, don't sell them if they're in that case. I don't know. Whatever. Um, I, I like a lot of the stuff the shop does. I don't want to badmouth them, but that was kind of a, a bummer experience there. I'll, I'll have to chat with them. I haven't really approached them, so it's not fair to say anything before I talk to them about like remedying the situation plus it's kind of hard to prove like oh i waited a month and a half and then all of a sudden this female i thought i was buying turned out to be a male like it's like you could make that up really easily so coming from where they're at i understand why that would be hard to deal with but let me know what you think of the aquascape i really for some reason have fallen in love with the rocks i wish this rock was a little smaller um I might switch it out eventually. That's weird. The shrimp tank is like the wiring on this thing is pretty janky um, because these are homemade. They are, I think, get rid of the Rotalia, make the rock seem dwarf. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think. I think I. Yeah. You know, I'd wanted the the um, compact temple plant to look like. A forest but what I might do is get green kabamba and do that this is even getting taller than I thought like I just did this I know it looks like a MC hammer or like whatever some bad 90s haircut uh, straight across but the dwarf hair grass even uh, is looking too tall so I think I'm gonna go with carpeting and crypts will be the tall point I really like this plant, and I'm spacing on the name of it, but it stays pretty small, and it kind of looks like little pine trees. It's not Mayaka. Mayaka, I do have in there, hidden behind. But um, I also want to have lots and lots of plants, enough so that, that like, the tank cleans itself, sort of. But you can see I got blue shrimp in there, and... Um, I like them to come out more. I think because of that, these gudgeons will be coming out and going into the big tank once the ick is gone. The gudgeons already had some babies. Um, hey, there's the there's the uh, Rotala Wallachia floating by. It looks similar to Mayaka. Um, I'll have to clean up all the floaties later, but I don't bother until I've made up my mind on what I'm doing over the weekend. So, all right, guys, if you don't have any more questions, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for subscribing, for liking, and for asking questions. If you have any more, feel free to ask me anytime. Uh, I'm going to try to get better at these. I'm hoping that we can grow as a channel to the point where I can do actual, um, where I can do uh, the streams with super chats and stuff because I know I love giving a buck to like Lucas or um, you know just different channels uh, Rachel um, O'Leary or whoever but it's hard sometimes to be on Patreon I mean I'm a broke artist basically like these fish tanks I've traded I've either grown fish or shrimp or um, plants or whatever and I've traded my way to getting all almost all of these I, I buy maybe $30 or $40 a month in new uh, food and fish. So, all right, well, Cecilia's Hobbies, thank you for joining. You stuck with me the whole time. I appreciate that, and it's been great chatting with folks. 
Uh, I want to pick a day that works for well for everyone and kind of like do a chat on uh, on a more regular basis. So let me know if there's a time and day that works for everybody, um, if you're watching this later and whatnot. And I really appreciate the people who keep coming and watching these things. It makes me want to spend time like on the the check fish video that I did a while back um, or the... Uh, Pleco naming video or the Kabamba or the Servasartong. Uh, I just like saying it the way it, the pronunciations and the umlauts say you should. Um, but those videos, I do like a week of researching a few hours a day, trying to find interesting stuff about, and I'd like to do more of those. Um, but I'm also kind of just doing an update type thing. Susvasartong! Yeah, exactly. I've been told that in the video, I pronounced it exactly like a drunk Bavarian by several Germans. So, <laughs> for what it's worth, yeah. Um, but, so I like to update you guys on what I am keeping in my tanks uh, so that we can then do species profile, plant profile, stuff like that. But the other big thing that I want to bring to this channel very soon is the actual people that have made history. So Gary Lang with his rainbow fish or, um, you know, um, Dean Tweedle and like all of the stuff he's brought back from South America, um, that kind of stuff. So um, Lucas, I love Lucas. He's like a mad scientist of fish. What up Lucas, if you see this, um, we'll chat soon. I would love to do a, a, a show together. Maybe we could get ahead, think about it ahead of time, look up some history topics and meld them with your master sensei raising husbandry of fish topics. Same with Rachel. I spoke with her about teaming up. She's kind of busy. A lot of these bigger channels are really busy and I can see how it could take a lot of time. I also just started an Instagram. I'll start linking that in the videos. Um, I'm trying to get my act together and learn this whole YouTube thing. I haven't ever really done it as a making a concerted effort to, to do it frequently. So really, we're two months in, and I can't thank you enough for being a part of this channel. Um, sharing links, watching videos, liking, subscribing, and then Patreon are all awesome ways, and it warms my heart that somebody else is interested in this. I love just having a group of people that we can chat. And everybody so far has been super civil in comments and things. Haven't had any trolling or like abusive behavior to one another. And I hope that the caliber of folks that want to learn the more nerdy side of things maybe are a little more mature than the like, 10 fish that'll eat your face, like those list channels, which I'll watch it. I'm curious, what's going to eat my face? But, um, that might have more of a clientele that's going to fight in the comments. And just the more people you get, the more that happens. But I want to try to keep up with all you guys in your comments. Sometimes I miss them. YouTube has a terrible system of letting you know when there's comments. Like, I'll see something from, like, three weeks ago, and it'll just say, like, so-and-so commented just because that video has a new comment, too. Um, but just comment again if I don't answer something. Uh or feel free to get a hold of me in other ways. Um, my website, somainkdesigns.com. I mean, it's got everything from my address all the way to my phone number, and I'm that open at this point. Um, I want a community, and I want a community here in the Northwest of fellow shrimpers and fellow fish breeders. And uh, yeah, so hope you guys all have a good Saturday night. You spent it here with me for a little while, and uh, I know we're like-minded folk if uh, we're hanging out talking about fish and uh, smuggling, duct taping crocodiles to your crotch on a Friday, no, Saturday night. So, <laughs> all right, guys, take it easy. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time. Keep on swimming. Take care of each other and yourself and your fish, mostly your fish. Take care of your fish. Bye, guys.